In this video, I'd like to begin talking about basically two subjects. The first is resources for astronomy, for amateur astronomy, things like software books, uh, websites, and so on, and also telescope control. But I'm going to defer the telescope control to another video so that it will have that name so that people that are interested in just that subject won't have to try to figure out where in this video to skip forward to. So uh, let's kind of get an idea of what I'm what I'm talking about. I've prepared a little bit of a of an overview of some resources that I have found useful, and I'll zoom in on those. See if uh, this new. I'm going to have to get used to this new tripod. The first is a website uh, called prairieastronomyclub.org that I have found great articles on. I would suggest that you, uh, you take a look at that site. It especially has articles on some more obtuse topics, uh, topics like uh, the use of filters and things like that. Skymaps.com is my go-to source for the evening sky maps. They produce a monthly uh, sky map, which I'll show you in a second. Finally, Better World Books is my go-to source for used books. The my understanding is that they are a part of the uh, Goodwill Industries book distribution system. At any rate, I have seen some good things and they seem to do uh, a pretty good job. They get me books quickly. They seem to have one of the widest uh, catalogs of used books. Sometimes can't find things there and have to go other places, but uh, but I'm kind of pitching Better World Books. Now, I don't have any association with any of these folks, but uh, I just found them useful over the time. So let's take a look at skymaps.com and what you can get from there. You can download an evening sky map like this from the evening from uh, skymaps.org and or uh, I'm sorry skymaps.com. This is one page and on the back are uh, a nice table of celestial objects. It's just a two-page PDF file. Uh, at the top are the objects that are easily seen with the naked eye and then easily seen with binoculars. And by that, what they mean is these, almost anyone with even not very good vision but reasonable vision should be able to see these. If you have really good vision, you'll probably be able to see many of these, but it'll look better in binoculars. And then finally, the telescopic objects are those that look better in telescopes. And once again, you might be able to even see some of these with the naked eye. So I find this particular sky map, I print one out pretty much every month, and uh, it's just two pages. Fortunately, my printer lets me print on the back so I can turn it into one. It's a great resource and when we talk about uh, sky atlases later, you'll find I'm a real fan of this type of, uh, of sky chart because you can see it. Uh, I find it easier to see at night when I my eye is dark adapted and I'm trying to use very little light. I find these much easier than some of the other things. So, the, the next thing that I'd like to mention are a couple of places on YouTube that I think are, are worth checking out. One is, if you're interested in any of the Celestron products, and others as well, including some Orion and Teleview and other things, Sliman does a much better job at videos than I do, and he seems to have a wealth of experience. Check out his site. Uh, uh, another site is Orion. Uh, they make telescopes and eyepieces and so on, but their website has some of the best 
tutorials. Now they also have uh, videos on their products and other things too. But if you're also looking for a site that has a lot of good tutorials with a lot of useful information, you might want to try that one next. Okay, now let's turn to books. Now I have listed here a few of my favorite books. The uh, We'll look at each of these, the Sky Atlas 2000, the Cambridge, uh, well, I don't know why it says Sat Atlas, but I think it should say Sky Atlas. Uh, a textbook called Stars and Galaxies, the Messier album, Advanced Sky Watching, and Burnham's Celestial Handbook, as well as some others. And finally, in this session, we'll also look at three pieces of software, the Sky, Starry Night, and CPWI, which is a uh, Celestron product. I think this stands for Plane Wave Instrument. Uh, why they have that? But it, anyway, it's, uh, it's, the, uh, tell us, it's the software that's used to control uh, at least my Celestron 8SE, uh, and it's very nice. So first let's take a look at these books, then a little bit on software, and we'll try to uh, transition at that point to uh, telescope control. This is one of the charts out of the Sky Atlas 2000. Now this is a rather large atlas that is produced uh, originally Will Tyrion. This particular is the second edition. You may or may not be able to read that up there near the near the top. And uh, it is really the go-to atlas if you're looking for something to really impress uh, yourself, uh, the eye, your your uh, your guests, at whatever. But it's a it's a very large and therefore easy to use format for use indoors. But frankly, I find this particular uh, form to be a little bulky to use on a day-to-day -day basis. And as a result, I also have a copy of what is called the Cambridge Star Atlas by the same author. Once again, this is the second edition. And I will tell you, the charts in here are exactly the same as the charts in the Sky Atlas 2000. It has some nice charts, and uh, maybe now is a time to talk about these, these blue backgrounds. I don't find these particularly useful. Uh, well, I don't mean they're not useful. They're fine in, in good light indoors. But frankly, when you get outdoors, I find this kind of chart with black on white to be easier to read in low light. And these charts, while they are considerably smaller, you can compare the size of that chart, for example. It's the same chart, not exactly this same chart. This is chart number two. Well, I guess they are numbered the same, but it's not of the same region of the sky. Uh, here it is. Here is the comparable chart of the same region of sky, or at least a part of the same region of sky. You may notice in the Sky Atlas 2000, this is only the bottom half of this chart. So these printings are about a fourth the size of these, but they are basically the same thing. They're from the same epoch. As resource material, these are probably the place to start. But I would be remiss if I didn't throw in a little bit of nostalgia. In an earlier video, or maybe more than once, I have pointed out that I got a, a uh, telescope when I was nine years old. My parents bought it for me, and it came with a copy of this book. Now, not this copy. I had to replace it because that copy I used so much that it fell apart years ago. This, this book was originally published, I think, in 1907. This particular copy was printed in, I think, the 1960s. It's a Dover edition. It was printed in 64, and I bought it as a replacement, but you can tell from the yellow pages and everything that it's... Uh, anyway, this was my first astronomy book. A few
few years later, I think I was 11 years old, when my aunt and uncle brought me a copy of this book. My aunt was a school teacher and my uncle had been an, a navigator during World War II. And so he knew quite a bit about astronomy and she knew quite a bit about kids and what they might be interested in. So they picked this book out. It's the Golden Book of Astronomy and I'm not recommending it to, uh, to this audience. But boy, in terms of getting me started, you can tell how old this, this is. It's, uh, the pages are brittle. But it really opened my eyes to, uh, to astronomy in ways that I don't think uh, I would have had the interest that I do. At any rate, so they're, they're, they're into the nostalgia. Now on to a few more books. This top book, Stars and Planets, by Ian Ridpath and Will Tyrion. Tyrion, of course, is the same guy that did uh, Sky Atlas 2000 and the Cambridge Star Atlas. This is a really nice book. It's called The Princeton Field Guide. But once again, the problem I have with it is these blue background charts just don't do it for me. And the reason that I like little books like this is to carry into the field. Well, if the only place they're useful is is in your library with lots of light, then why have the little one? You might as well buy a big book. And for that reason, this is the one that I prefer, A Field Guide to the Stars and Planets by Menzel. And the reason is that, as you see, over here is what the sky actually looks like. And then over here is a very nice black on white star chart with, I will mention, the the declination axes, and we'll talk about that maybe when we talk about using uh, setting circles on a telescope, but basically the way you find your way around the sky isn't with latitude and longitude, it's with declination and right ascension. And so it's nice that this has those. You'll find some star charts that are sort of popular, but they don't include that, which means it's almost impossible to find that object without a lot of translation. Great book. This is my real go-to guide in terms of a field guide. A set of books that I found very good in terms of some of their illustrations are published by a company called Firefly. The Moon Observer's Guide has some pretty nice books, uh, maps of the, of the moon. I really like this style. I won't try to show you the details of this, but I found this to be a real nice little reading book. But, once again, part of the problem is that it's a little bit small for, for reading and a little bit uh, unuseful uh, in the field. Similarly, the Deep Sky Observer's Guide. This is a really nice book. It contains entries for a lot of the deep sky objects that might be of interest, the Messier objects, the new general catalog, as well as the uh, index catalog, the IC numbers, and the, uh, but once again, you see all the charts are in blue and they're so small that I find them hard to to use without a magnifier to be honest with you and a few years ago I had real bad eyesight I couldn't read these at all now I've had my I've had eye surgery and my eyes are a little better at any rate that's the uh, uh, a really a good book this is also a great book and more importantly It has these moon maps that I showed you earlier in a larger format. The, finally, the, the last atlas of the night sky that I like is the Collins Atlas. This is published by the Smithsonian Institution. Now, once again, it's the, it's the blue, but, in, but at least in this case, they use a light blue background. This is much easier to read at night than those dark blue backgrounds. At least I find it so. This book, Night Watch, A Practical Guide to Viewing the Universe by Terence Dixon, has what I find to be actually the most useful uh, sky charts of all. Notice that they are, uh, they are large, they are simple, they don't include a lot of the background. 
But for finding specific objects in the sky, I find this book to be one of the best. Now, I will tell you that one reason I mentioned Better World Books earlier is almost all of these books I have bought on Better World Books at used prices. They sell a lot of these books for just a few dollars. Three bucks is a, is a common, three, three bucks with free shipping, by the way. And once again, I'm not associated with them, but uh, uh, I don't recommend that you go out and try and buy all these books. I'm just giving you my impressions of them. I would buy at least one good, uh, one book that has a good set of sky charts in it at some point, and uh, some sort of background book on the, the sky and uh, the objects in it. Speaking of a good all-around background book. This, The Universe from Your Backyard, and by the way, uh, I'll mention David Eicher is the author, and we'll see his uh, some of his work in, uh, again when we talk about some of the comprehensive uh, catalogs. I have found that one to be useful, as well as this one, Advanced Sky Watching by The Nature Company. And this one is one of the best gee whiz books I mean, it's really a lot of eye candy. If you're interested in the uh, deep sky objects called the Messier objects, and I think there are 110 of them, though I think originally uh, Messier only had 104, but some have been added. This is, in my opinion, the best book on the Messier objects. It's called the Messier Album, and you'll notice that it has a, the particular object, in this case this is a, a galaxy in Virgo called M58. A nice picture, and one of the things I like about these pictures is they tend to be about what you see in a good telescope. And by a good telescope I mean a good amateur telescope, not the, the 40 inch monstrosities that uh, they have at big observatories. And uh, also little uh, additional charts to help you find your way around where the sky is a little bit busy. So, Messier album. Second thing, too, is this book called the Messier Marathon. There is a, an event that uh, some astronomers do, which is uh, the attempt to see all the Messier objects. <laughs> Better still, there are a few nights a year when you have a chance, if you're in the right place, at the right time to see all the Messier objects. So, uh, just like amateur radio operators try to do things like worked all states and uh, worked all counties and worked all, well anyway, uh, some astronomers, amateur astronomers, try to do the entire Messier marathon. I haven't even seen all the Messier objects yet, much less done it in one day. But this is a pretty good book. It's by Don Mackenholtz, I think, or Mackholtz. Uh, the Observing Guide to the Messier Marathon. Moving on to uh, more comprehensive works for amateur astronomers, this book by Eicher, I said I would mention his name again, Deep Sky Observing with Small Telescopes, is a very good introduction. And the, the same publishing company that does the uh, this book also does the Webb Society Deep Sky Observer's Handbook. Let me zoom in on that one a little bit. There we are. And that handbook comes in a series of volumes. I'll show you down here. That is one of the best sources. Here, here is an example of one of those. This is volume three uh, on open and globular clusters. The Webb Society Deep Sky Observer's Handbook is very comprehensive, and the uh, it is full of these telescopic views of what you actually will see, or at least on good, on good nights with a, a reasonable telescope, what you can see. Uh, 
that's like I say that comes in I think six volumes I think I only have the first five because the sixth volume is uh, well at any rate it's Southern Sky and I don't have that Burnham's Celestial Handbook is another comprehensive observer's guide this has been around for quite a while it's republished by Dover and sometimes you can pick these up fairly cheaply at used bookstores if you're looking for uh, a book that has pretty much everything that uh, an amateur astronomer might be interested in in the night sky that is outside the solar system this is is it Murdom's Celestial Handbook comes in three volumes and like I say if you look around on used book sites you can probably find a whole set for a reasonable price say under $20 uh, normally they sell for a lot more than that Okay, well that is enough about books. Let me turn now to software and, and then I will uh, close this out and transition, as I say, to controlling telescopes, which overlaps with the software topic. Here is some of the software that has come with some of the telescopes or I have otherwise purchased. The limited edition Starfinder software, you can tell it came on, uh, this, I think this ran on Windows 95, and in fact I think I still have a copy of this running on a Windows 98 computer around here somewhere. I won't bother you with it because it's a little out of date of course, but it was very useful and it actually uh, helped me learn the sky. Another one that I found useful is the Orbits, uh, which is uh, came on two discs once again pretty nice expert astronomer had a and I think I have another one in here that's by them well actually I think I have two one is Redshift 2 by expert astronomy and the other is expert CD-ROM astronomer those were pretty good. Once again, dated. I think they run on Windows 98, maybe Windows XP. I also got some software from the BBC's Sky at Night program, and it, the I used to subscribe to this, and one of the bonus CD-ROMs that came along included Starry Night Backyard. Very nice program, a lot of eye candy, uh, it's not my favorite, but it's, it's certainly on my list of uh, recommended software, Starry Night. And by the way, you get a free copy of Starry Night with uh, if you buy a new Celestron telescope. At least I think you still do. Uh, stars and Astronomy Today I found useful. Redshift, you saw that earlier in Redshift 2. Redshift is one of the really good nice programs, but the one that I found actually the most useful is called the Sky. And part of the reason is I like the charts, you can print them out, uh, they, you, they include right ascension and declination on the charts, they, you can see the charts that, that you print out at night, uh, it's fun to work with, and if I were going to recommend one piece of Sky software, that doesn't come with a telescope, I would say this is it. Okay, let me now go uh, close this video out and transition to the next subject, which is going to be on telescope control. And I hope you'll stay tuned for that one. I'll try to put them up at about the same time. But if I don't see you for a while, have a nice day.